Hi, it's Romeo Bruni again. Welcome to the Astronomy Channel. I'm happy you're listening. I'm happy you're here. One of my favorite topics, the James Webb Space Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared sensing telescope. Why infrared? If we were to actually look at the images that the James Webb Space Telescope is seeing, we would not see them because the light being perceived is in the infrared region, as opposed to the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, which takes images in the visible and ultraviolet spectrum. The James Webb is in the infrared spectrum. Why on earth, haha, why on earth is it taking images in a light wave that we can't even perceive. And there's very good reasons why it does that. In fact, there's three major reasons why it does that, and we're gonna go through the three today. The first and most important reason is that the primary goal of the James Webb Space Telescope was to look as far out into the universe as possible. And of course, we know that as for the further you look out into the universe, it's actually a time machine and you're looking back in time. The James Webb Telescope is so sensitive an instrument, it can detect galaxies that are billions of light years away. In fact, they are so far away that the light emitted from those galaxies was emitted around the time of the cosmic dawn. James Webb Space Telescope is examining the cosmic dawn. What is the cosmic dawn? Let's review that. To do that, we have to do a very quick recap of the, of the Big Bang. The Big Bang, again, is not an origin theory. The Big Bang starts from the point where there's a very hot, dense, concentrated uh, entity and describes what happens to that hot, dense, concentrated entity from that point on and how it explains the universe as we see it. Now, this hot, dense entity, uh, the Big Bang, of course, when it started, was not visible. It was a singularity, but it began to expand from that point onwards. And it took 300,000 years, approximately 380,000 years, for light to escape. And that's because the universe was so dense and hot that photons themselves could not escape. They were just being bounced around and refracted and contained within the system, if you will, and were not released. So they're, they could not be seen if they're not released. Around 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe cooled off enough that atoms were forming, that electrons were uh, being captured around nuclei, and this uh, created a transparency to the universe for the first time so that uh, light could escape. That light that escaped, that first light that escaped is the cosmic microwave background radiation. Of course, that's been detected by other telescopes that are looking for even longer wavelength light, not the James Webb, because that light uh, emitted uh, when the universe was approximately 3000 degrees Kelvin hot uh, was from the sort of plasma that the Big Bang was then. At that point, the universe consisted only of hydrogen and helium and small amounts of, the, uh, of lithium. There were no higher elements. There were no stars. So since you only had this hot plasma at 3000 degrees and that slowly was cooling, the only light emitted would be very long wavelength from that entity. Um, that's why we have a period called the Dark Ages. So the Dark Ages are after the universe has expanded past 380,000 years. So we have this entity that we can now see via the cosmic microwave background radiation, but there's no stars yet to be emitting new light. So that universe continued to cool and cool, but within it, stars and galaxies started to form. And it wasn't until hundreds of million year, of years later when stars had formed from giant hydrogen molecular clouds that condensed and then through the process of nuclear fusion, the hydrogen uh, was condensed to helium, the helium to lithium and so on. In other words, we start to have stars 
which due to gravity and the incredible heat and pressure that the hydrogen and helium are under, start to forge the higher elements. And in creating these higher elements and in the process of nuclear fusion, they start to emit light again. So we have the Big Bang, the light of this cosmic macro background radiation, no other light emitted, millions and millions of years of uh, dark ages until we start to see the first galaxies that formed, that first stars forming again. And when the first stars formed again, new light started to be emitted from that universe. And it's that new light from these first galaxies that the uh, James Webb Telescope is looking at, i.e. the cosmic dawn. So why the infrared? Well, the, we have to examine in infrared for a very important reason. Even though the light emitted by those galaxies way back when is probably very similar to the light emitted from galaxies nearby right now, i.e. across the whole spectrum of light, including the majority of the light in the visible spectrum, that, by the way, is why we see the human eye sees uh, the light as we do, it's because it corresponds to the maximum or the peak light emitted by our sun. Our sun emits most of its light in the visible spectrum and evolution has designed our eyes to be best performing in the areas where the sun emits most of its light. So way back when, when the galaxies were emitting their light, they were normal spectrum of light that we have like from our present galaxies. In other words, lots of light in the visible range, lots of light in the ultraviolet range, etc. But because of dark energy and universal expansion, light that was emitted from galaxies, let's say 13 billion years ago, has had 13 billion years of universal expansion to deal with before reaching us. And this universal expansion creates a kind of a redshift that we term cosmological redshift. It's very similar to Doppler redshift uh, in, in certain ways, but isn't in many. It's not anything to do with velocity per se. It has to do with the actual expansion of space, mainly between galaxies. So galaxies that emerged from the dark ages 13, 12 billion years ago, the light from that galaxy, although initially emitted in the visible range, is gonna be cosmologically redshifted, cosmologically expanded, so that by the time it reaches us now and the James Webb Telescope, it's in the infrared range. In other words, you would not see it with a visible telescope. The wavelengths have simply been uh, expanded and stretched out of the visible range and back into the infrared. So if you want to see galaxies near the cosmic dawn, that light will now be in the uh, infrared range. So it's the only way to do it. Um, how much it stretches, I'll give you an example. We, we, we call Z sort of the, uh, the distance back into the universe. It's a sort of a time measure. Uh, and the Z is equal to, Z plus one is equal to the wavelength of the observed light that we catch now versus the wavelength of the light when it was emitted. So for example, galaxies so far away such that when their light was emitted, let's say the, the wavelength is 2000 or uh, um, when it, we observe it now, it's 2,000 angstroms. And when it was admitted, it was very short. So we'll say it was in the ultraviolet range, let's say 400 angstroms. So 2,000 divided by 400 equals five. So Z plus one equals five. So Z equals four. So Z equals four would correspond to light that has been stretched five times its length that it started out from that would correspond to 12, 11, 12 billion years uh, be, uh, after uh, ago or one or two billion years after the Big Bang. The furthest back we've seen is Z's approximately 12 to 14. And in that case, we were actually seeing galaxies uh, and the light emitted from those galaxies were only 300 to 400 million years after the Big Bang. 
so very, very close back to the cosmic dawn. So again, we need the infrared because the light now that we see has been shifted into the re infrared by um, cosmological red shifting, by the expansion of the universe. So the first and primary reason is to examine the cosmic dawn. Now, the other advantage, there's other reasons why we're, they, there are, that, that's the main reason. And, and since you're working in infrared, uh, there are certain advantages in infrared that you have when you're examining things that are close by and the light hasn't been shifted that far because these are you're examining planets and galaxies that are close to us. So there's not been a lot of cosmological red shifting. In that case, you're taking advantage of the, the uh, ability of infrared light to penetrate uh, clouds and to penetrate uh, dust. Unlike ultraviolet radiation and uh, radiation in the visible range either, which will be refracted and scattered by dust and clouds, infrared light penetrates much better and is not refracted. So you can essentially see through cloud and dust and see things that would have been previously obscured by trying to see it in other wavelengths. So this allows you to peer through nebula. This allows you to peer through uh, the disks of planetary nebulae to see, uh, or, or proto, uh, planetary protostars, to see the, um, the beginnings of, the, of new stars, that type of thing. So it's a type of spying that is allowed, which wouldn't otherwise be able to with infrared, with normal visible light. Um, third area where infrared is valuable, and that's in exoplanets, discovering and more importantly, trying to analyze the atmosphere of exoplanets. Because a lot of the chemical processes that go on emit light in the infrared area. So if you want to see the chemical signatures of, for example, water, or carbon dioxide, when there's um, energy shifts within specific uh, things like whatever elements, they'll create absorption lines. Elements are small molecules, they'll they create very specific absorption lines that mark that uh, element or small molecule. So by doing spectroscopy, and spectroscopy is when you take the light uh, that you receive from any object and break it down then into the, wave, the actual wavelengths of the various uh, wavelengths of light that you get and break it down, that's called spectroscopy. And various elements and small molecules will, from a black body radiation, absorb uh, certain um, specific wavelengths of light and create uh, what we call absorption spectra. These are essentially markers for chemical, for elements, and small molecules. So by doing spectroscopy, near-red spectroscopy, of the light that we obtain, let's say from an exoplanet that's transiting a, a large star, you can look at the light uh, specifically passing through the atmosphere of that exoplanet and be able to determine the constituent parts of that atmosphere. Does it have a, a carbon dioxide? Does it have methane? Does it have water? Is there uh, sodium, et cetera, et cetera? You can break down uh, the com chemical composition. So the James Webb telescope, then the information it's receiving is in the infrared. So what is it, uh, what is it actually doing? What it's doing is the uh, James Webb Telescope at Lagrange Point 2, which is 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth, has to be far away from the Earth and the Sun so that it can stay cool. That's why it has the umbrella or the shield to protect it from heat because it doesn't want heat from the Sun to interfere with the infrared heat light it's receiving from distant galaxies. It's put out there and the information and it's going to use various filters and it's going to bring light in uh, that's in the infrared. So the images you're going to get are going to be like that. In other words, there's going to be no color. There's just going to be uh, a signal 
for light at this particular wavelength in the infrared region has uh, been received. And that's going to seem as white, if you will, on, on this. It's just uh, a particular photon wavelength. So then they use different filters to gather light at the, uh, the specific infrared uh, frequency. Uh, let's say around 2,000 angstroms, then they look at, let's say, 2,200, and then at 1,800. So just like in the visible spectrum, we see, uh, we see uh, the red at the lower wavelength, at, at, at the higher wavelength, and then we can see uh, blue at, uh, at shorter wavelengths, higher frequencies. We're doing the same with infrared. We're picking up infrared at different uh, frequencies, so we're getting... Uh, spectrum of information, but of course that would be invisible to our eye. In order for us to see it, and in, in order to more clearly illustrate the information that the James Webb telescope has captured, then uh, they go through a process that's called false coloring. Now, false coloring does not mean that it's false information or that the information has been contrived in any way. The false coloring merely shifts the data that we received in the infrared region and shifts it into the visible region so that we can see it. The data is not distorted such that the uh, information, once it's shifted, is proportionately shifted. So all the frequencies are proportionally shifted. And that way, that gives us more visual information that we can take in because we, the, uh, the red light for the longer wavelengths will be visible to us versus uh, shorter wavelength, higher energy light that will be colored up into the blue range and we can see. So we can actually see with our own eyes more information than we could uh, without the color. So it's really a way of just expressing the information um, more clearly. In terms of the cosmic dawn, that expression, may, you may interpret that as actually bringing the light back to uh, wavelengths uh, that uh, they were when they were first admitted. It's almost eliminating, if you will, the um, expansion of space and the shifting of light out of the visible range. So you can almost, in, in essence, see the galaxy as... Um, it was the emitted light long ago. I'm going to show you just a few uh, photographs here of, of various things. Of course, the typical kind of photograph uh, that James Webb is taking like that, that's when you're looking for cosmic dawn stuff, and in which case you point the telescope at an area of space and look and hold it steady and try to capture the light from as far distant objects as you can. And then, the, for example, in this case, you're seeing a little smudge, which when expanded, shows a sort of reddish galaxy. Uh, and that is like a very, very distant galaxy. And it's been colorized, of course, false colored up because it would only appear as like infrared light to us. So again, images of deep space. And you'll notice uh, another subject, you see all this uh, gravitational lensing where you can see uh, one galaxy and nu numerous uh, images of the same galaxy because it's been uh, lensed by uh, whatever on the way to you. So you can see multiple images of it. So that's uh, searching for the cosmic dawn. Um, of course, uh, th these, these are examples of uh, James Webb versus hum Hubble looking at near objects at nebulae. You can see with the Hubble, uh, you see nice structure, but you don't see the stars and the detail in behind that you see with the James Webb, and that's because the Hubble is in the visible range, and uh, the stars in behind are being obscured, but meanwhile the James Webb, using infrared, is able to peer through the gas and dust, etc., and see stuff that the Hubble couldn't see because infrared penetrates clouds, the, the famous uh, pillars of creation, uh, again, uh, the Hubble versus the James Webb. With the James Webb, you'll be able to peer, peer through dust and gas. Again, Hubble versus the James Webb peering through dust and gas. Uh, here's examples of spectroscopy that's obtained on planets and things where you analyze the 
uh, light and looking for absorption spectra, and you can determine the atmosphere of exoplanets. And of course, um, it's also used in the same way to examine planets in our solar system. This, for example, is Jupiter looked at in the infrared light. You're going to be able to see through uh, the cloud and dust, a lot of the cloud and dust on Jupiter, and pick up details that were uh, previously uh, obscured. Again, Hubble versus James Webb. James Webb peering through and seeing more details of Jupiter. And of course, it's not just for Jupiter. Here we have an example of the uh, planet uh, Neptune, uh, Voyager versus Hubble versus uh, James Webb. You can see with the James Webb, we can actually see rings around uh, Neptune that uh, weren't very visible with the Hubble Space Telescope. So um, to summarize, oh, an example of uh, planetary nebula, uh, Hubble versus James Webb being able to look through the, the dust and gas. So to summarize, the James Webb Space Telescope is looking at light that to us would be invisible. And that light is in the infrared region. And the major and primary reason it does that is because that light from distant galaxies has been shifted from the visible range to the infrared range because of universal expansion. And the only way to see that light now is to uh, try to see it in the light that it exists in. In other words, it's in the infrared. It's no longer in this higher region. So you wouldn't see anything at the, in those higher levels that's been stretched out of that. So if we want to see the cosmic dawn, you have to go infrared. And there's other advantages to infrared that are sort of like ancillary and uh, lucky to have, but aren't the primary reason. I hope you enjoyed this. See you again soon. I'm Romeo Bruni. Ciao.